Okay, uh, hello, uh, welcome to this uh, meetup about Apache Kafka. Um, I'm Jenny Thompson, I'm a software engineer at Alpine Data Labs, and I'm also one of the organizers of SF Bin La Big Analytics. Um, we have, we do quite a few uh, big data and analytics style uh, meetups, and we have a few coming up uh, over, the, over the next month or two, so if you can check the website for that. Um, today, uh, we have Jay Kreps from uh, the, who's the CEO of Confluent, um, and he was formerly a, a, a lead architect of data infrastructure at LinkedIn, um, and the leader of, of several open source projects, including uh, Project Voldemort, uh, Apache Kafka, um, what was the, <laughs> okay, uh, uh, yeah, um, Apache Samza, that was the, the other one on the list. Um, and so he, he'll be talking to you more about Apache Kafka, which, which is a pretty exciting project. Um, but before we do that, I just want to uh, give Yelp a chance to say a few words because they've been generally ho generously hosting quite a few of our meetups. So uh, here's Ben. Thanks. Um, just wanted to welcome you all here to Yelp. Um, ben Goldenberg, I'm a search quality manager here at Yelp. Um, welcome to all of you here. We're excited to hear uh, more about Kafka and streaming data. Um, also, just wanted to give a short note that we're of course, hiring across all of our teams here, uh, including <laughs> infrastructure ones, data mining roles. We use Kafka heavily both for things like click logs and for uh, updating data platforms throughout our system, streaming data from our databases into indexing layers and things like that. Um, with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Jay. Hi, everyone. Oh, wow, it's so interactive. <laughs> it's always a test. If you say hi and people say hi, you know it's going to be fun. And people are just like, oh. <laughs> um, OK, so I'm going to be talking about Kafka in a stream data platform, whatever that is. Um, here we go. So a lot of this work um, came out of LinkedIn. I, I was previously you know, a bunch of different things there. Uh, finally, kind of the, the architect for um, data infrastructure. And you know when I when I started involved in this project, the focus for us was really Hadoop adoption, and we were focused really on getting Hadoop, getting all our data into Hadoop, um, whatever that meant. It was just very cool, and we wanted it, and we had a bunch of data, and we thought, you know, how hard could this be? You know, we will we'll spend a few weeks, and we'll copy in all our data, and then we will you know spend a lot of time like generating valuable products on top of that. And um, we did generate the valuable products on top of it, but it turned out to be much more painful to actually get all the data. And I kind of, you know, I got an opportunity to really kind of go on this interesting journey of how data flows in organizations, which I'll talk about, and I'll talk about, you know, how that led to the work we did uh, for Kafka. So um, the problems we ran into are, you know, not super surprising to anyone who's been in this area. I previously had no background in like ETL. I, I don't even think I knew what it stood for. Um, I, I you know, had been involved in some infrastructure development. I'd done like a key value store for LinkedIn. Um, but I, I, I really had been focused more on like infrastructure and analytics and didn't really know anything about how data moved around. But you know, as part of this Hadoop project, I really kind of got my hands dirty with it. And you know, the, the problems we ran into were like, it turns out there's just a lot of data in a company. <laughs> and getting coverage of all that's really hard. And so we kind of worked and worked and worked, and we really felt like we had only a, a fraction of the things represented in Hadoop. You know, we, we had all these different heterogeneous systems, like different databases we had to integrate with and, and get data out of. Um, they all kind of had different data formats and nuances you had to work with. And then, you know, worst of all or best of all, they were all kind of undergoing constant change. Like there were, you know, engineers we were paying to make those make that data better <laughs> and make new products. And, and all that change would have to flow into this Hadoop area. And um, you know, as we were trying to figure out how to grapple with this problem and actually really make this a successful platform, uh, I kind of I thought, well, you know, I, I don't really want to like, you know, um, build you know, like a massive team of consultants that does you know, data loading. So I, I should kind of learn something about this area and learn how it works so that I can get out of this like, one-off integration uh, work that, that I was kind of doing. And so I went on this tour of like how data flowed, which turns out to be like a very scary thing once you like 
pull the curtains back, and I'll, I'll kind of walk through the state of LinkedIn in, in 2009 when we were doing this kind of adoption. And um, you know, I'll, I'll talk about a little bit of the evolution. Um, a lot of this is not that different from what you would see in you know a variety of companies. It, you know, if you went and talked to them. So, you know, the the first kind of data that everybody recognizes is you know data in databases. Um, that that's the most obvious thing. So we we at that time we had Oracle and we had this key value store we built. Um, those were our two databases. We had you know a way for applications to kind of subscribe and pull for changes. Um, and this was how we updated like our search index, and and we had a way to kind of do you know dumps into either our Oracle data warehouse, which later became Teradata, or Hadoop, which I was working on. And that was the state of the art. We had a way to get data into the key value store, but we had no way of getting it out, which was you know kind of a drawback. This was pretty real time, but there was like really no ability to go back and catch up. This was like very batch and just happened once a day. So everything was like a little different. Um, this, neither of these were like very scalable, but they didn't have to be because there was like Oracle in front, which was really expensive. So um, it kind of, you know, uh, kept us from having more data than we could pull out. Um, then, you know, what we were really interested in was kind of like user events, what people were doing and, you know, clicks, impressions, you know, ad displays, um, you know, everything that was happening, all that kind of stuff that you actually want in your Hadoop cluster. And, um, you know, what we had for that was this really kind of ad hoc logging service that would write to some NFS, you know, like filer thing, and then we would like rsync it around, and then we would, you know, load it into Hadoop. Um, and, you know, I still kind of have rsync nightmares or PTSD or whatever. I'm like, what, you know, what's going on? Why is it? Well, it's rsync. It was always rsync, which, you know, is a great piece of software, but, but maybe not great if it's like a critical data pipeline. And this was also super batchy and only got data to these things. And uh, then we had, you know, kind of like metrics data. Like um, people don't even really think about this as being data, but like metrics about how our applications were running, like counters. You know, what's the size of this queue? You know, what's what's the you know latency or QPS um, and logs, right? So, and by logs, I mean like application logs, like you know, um, you know, errors or what do you always log out to the console? Like this should never happen, right? When you see that one, you know something really bad has just happened, right? Um, and, and so we had some kind of like tools around these, but they really, you know, the data really just went to these tools. So this was pretty real time, um, but it was very kind of special purpose. And, and finally, we had, you know, some messaging systems. We had at the time uh, ActiveMQ. It was kind of deployed just in a few different places, like for email and a few other things. So it was not, you know, broadly deployed. And this was kind of our data flow. Each of these things, you know, each of these things made sense. They had different limitations. Some could scale, like the log data pipeline was pretty scalable, uh, but it was batch. And the various ways of handling database data, um, they didn't scale that well. But the key value thing, that scaled, but it was like only in one direction. And so it was kind of like, you kind of had like little parts of the problem solved in different ways. And this was kind of part of what made it so difficult was when you put all this together, like individually the pieces all kind of made sense, but you put them all together and it's like very complicated. In each of these pipelines of data, as a fraction of data that you know it it was built to deal with, and kind of it makes sense on its own. But as you grow, you have to scale each of these like pipelines differently, and you know it's very hard to take the batch you know log file copy process and make it a real time you know thing. Like it just it's very hard to like like make the rsync you know more frequent to the point where you can actually use that data for more real time uses. It's very hard to make it reliable enough that. You, know, you can make it the source of your, your search index. So like, th this just became the source of complexity and pain. And for things that depend on data, like downstream data systems like Hadoop or Search, they're kind of only as good as the data they have in them. And whatever that data is, is messed up or bad, then everything's broken. So, um, so this, this kind of source of pain, I, I felt, was growing worse and worse, especially as we kind of scaled the website and had more data as we went like multi-data center. Of course, this was like, spread over multiple data centers, and we had to think of different ways that that would work for each of these pipelines. And it was basically very, very painful. And you know, coming from like an infrastructure background, I was really interested if there was some kind of infrastructure solution. So infrastructure is, you know, you kind of hold up and you work on something for a long time, and you build some like really fancy hammer, and then you can like hit all your problems with that hammer. And you know, if it's a good hammer, that's good, and if it's a bad hammer, then that was a big waste of time. Uh, but I like that kind of solution, you know, much more than growing a lar large like consulting team that would kind of work on, you know, parsing CSVs and mapping them into Hive tables, which was not that appealing. 
So, um, so I really wanted some kind of infrastructure uh, solution, and you know, we kind of thought about this, and we had kind of done this survey of you know how data flowed, you know, at LinkedIn and other companies, and you know, we kind of came to a couple of like realizations or principles of how we could maybe make this work. So the first realization was you could take all of these different types of data that we had, and you could think of them as events. So some of these are really obvious, like. If somebody clicks on something, that's kind of like an event. It's something that happened. And so that one like, doesn't take a genius to figure out. Um, it turns out metrics data is that way as well, right? You're, you know, maybe once a second, the application is producing some metrics about how it's performing. And you can think of that, like that, that record as an event. Um, it turns out logging. You know, w w people tend to think about logging and log files. And it's very like, your thinking is very tied to the mechanism. Like, you have a log file, it's a text file, it has the date in the name, it rolls over. Um, but if you think about those like lines, which are usually like the unit of a log file, that's kind of an event too, it's like something that happened. Like when, when somebody prints out, this should never happen. <laughs> I don't know if anybody's seen that in a log file, that's this should never happen. People always put that, it's like try, catch, this should never happen. No, nobody's ever seen that, it's just me, it's usually late at night when you see it, and you're like, huh. <laughs> and yet it has. Um, so that's an event. Uh, and um, you know, finally, and this is probably the, the more mind-bending one, you could actually think of updates to any kind of data system, like a database, you could think of that as an event as well. And the event is, the value of this row is now this. Um, and that, that type of event is obviously really important if you're going to have a search replica or a social graph replica or other types of data systems that have the same data. And um, so, okay, so this was the first realization. Um, and I, you know, to make this concrete, what I mean by event is some snippet of data. So maybe it's some JSON, we were using Avro, it could be pretty much anything, but it's gonna have some properties, it's like a record, right? Um, and the, the second realization was basically that all of these different pipelines or ways of copying data, you could think of as streams of events. And, you know, the, the property of this stream, you, you know, you could have different properties. Some of ours were real time and some of them were batch. Some of them you had to like get all the data there and some of them were more like best effort, like don't lose too much and nobody will notice. Uh, <laughs> that's always a good one, right? Like if it's noticeably bad, that's, that's the SLA. Um, <laughs> it, it's true that these things exist. Um, and so you could, you could think of all these as a kind of stream of events and that could be kind of a common representation. And if you had these ideas, you could, you could have something which would like hold all these streams and you could plug in your databases and you could plug in your key value store and you could plug in you know, events coming out of applications like for a website that clicks and whatever. And this could act as a kind of multiplexer or source for all kinds of other data systems. So you could, you know, uh, I, I, I could get out of my Hadoop consultant data copying role and copy stuff here, that whole warehouse ecosystem could use that as well. Um, we had a ton of like derived data systems. I put search there, but we, you know, we had a social graph and a news feed and a bunch of things that were like kind of custom representations of data that, that needed you know, feeds. And, and then we, you know, we felt this could also act as a basis for kind of like real-time monitoring and alerting and like the stream of what's happening. That's usually what you want to measure and monitor and alert off. Like what is happening in the business? That's what you want to measure. Um, and, you know, the stream processing area, I'll talk a little bit more in, in more detail. So that'll just be like a mysterious box. I mean, probably not really, but uh, up there for now. And so this was the idea. We thought, well, if we could build something like this, this would really, um, you know, this would really solve all these problems and, and get, get, get me out of my Hadoop uh, problem as well as hopefully solve the rest of this. And we would just have to get the right characteristics for the thing in the middle. And, um, you know, the, the kind of idea here is that one of the ways we could handle data would be, you know, publish your events to this kind of platform. So, you know, the, let, let's say this was LinkedIn, so what does LinkedIn have? You know, in addition to sending people lots of emails, there's like jobs, right? And people view the job, so that's like one activity that happens on LinkedIn. And, you know, uh, at first you have like pretty simple use case, which is maybe you have a web application, and it says, hey, you know, a job was viewed and it publishes that. And maybe there's really only one subscriber to that, which is Hadoop, and it gets into some Hive table. Um, but over time, you know, by, by having this kind of general hub for it, you actually find that there's, there's actually a lot of use cases for this. So first of all, the places jobs can be viewed, you know, gross, and you end up with like 
a dozen mobile interfaces, uh, you know, for every type of tablet and everything else, maybe APIs and partner sites that show them. And they can all generate that same kind of structured record in the same canonical format, and all the job views look the same regardless of where they came from. But, but second of all, other systems that want that data can kind of plug in. And these systems don't have to, like, coordinate with these people. Like, they don't have to come back and be like, oh, you have to add, like, you know, something for, you know, whatever. And, you know, we found there was a bunch. Like, so in addition to the warehouse area, you know, this was something where people would, you know, scrape the site or do some abusive thing. And the security team usually wanted to be able to, like, look at what was happening and, and you know, shut that down. We had job poster analytics for people who, like, pay and post a job will tell you, like, oh, you know, this many people saw it and they didn't apply. So maybe you should work on the description. Um, and we recommended jobs to people, um, sometimes well and sometimes not. And you know, this was an important area of the business, so there was like monitoring on you know, whether people were actually seeing jobs or not. And so most of these other use cases we actually didn't think of at the time we were capturing the data. Like it wasn't like somebody was like, oh, you know, all the requirements the organization will ever have for this type of data is falling. No, like they basically just published it and we had you know, some format. And all these other things could come on later and kind of latch on and, and suck it up. That, that was kind of the thinking and motivation for how this could work. And you know, we had enough use cases, we felt like, hey, this story would be plausibly useful if we could kind of build this thing in the middle, this you know, stream data platform that would, that would have all the streams. So the question was just like, okay, great, you know, we, we want to build this, you know, what are we going to do? Um, what we had at the time were messaging systems, which seemed like a really good fit. Like, they have messages that like, stream in and then they stream out to other things, and so we thought, okay, we will, you know, we'll take, uh, we had ActiveMQ, we thought we'll take that and we'll build this big platform for streams on top of it. And um, we, you know, we got as far as like really getting kind of like a production workload to simulate. And it turned out it was actually not as great a fit as it looked. Like the, the kind of use cases that these systems were built for were not quite what we were doing in, in a bunch of different ways. So, you know, first of all, the throughput for these kind of more enterprise messaging systems was not what we would want. For, for kind of like low value data like logs, you know? Um, logs have to be cheap because they're like logs, they're not that important. Um, and you know, we kind of did some back of the envelope calculation. If we were to actually take all the data and, and put it in ActiveMQ at, at that time, we realized we would have to have as many ActiveMQ servers as we had like other servers. And so that's like not gonna, <laughs> that's not gonna work. Um, and you know, the, the second issue was it wouldn't work well as an integration point for Hadoop or offline systems because the ability to persist data in the messaging systems was kind of an afterthought. It was like, like some of them were actually built to be in memory, and then if you like run out of memory, they kind of came up with something clever of how they would kind of write it out to disk, but it wasn't really thought through. And so what would happen, of course, is your performance would go down by like a thousand X when that happened. And so it was like, you know, if you got one second behind, the whole system would like melt down because it would start to spill out to disk and that would be the end of the world. Um, and then the, the last bit was really around like, delivering updates in order, which is really important for search or any type of like database changes where, you know, if I update my user account twice, you have to deliver those records to the search index in the right order or you end up with the wrong, the wrong thing. Um, so being able to do that and then, you know, be able to run all this as kind of a scalable service. So, so our attempt at using the systems was not, you know, not at all successful. Um, they, they've advanced, you know, in their own right as projects, but but we thought, well, okay, you know, that was kind of disappointing and we wasted a bunch of time. But our second attempt was we would build something. Um, and we thought, like, you know, how hard could it be? Uh, you know? <laughs> um, and we said, you know, three months, that is how long it will take. Uh, because when you really have no idea how long something will take three months is like, you know, the max, <laughs> the max time that you can estimate. It's like integer dot max value for software engineers is like three months. Like, I don't know, three months probably. Um, and um, we did get something done. Uh, I think it took more than three months, maybe like four or five months. Um, and then we worked on it for like the next five years. So that, <laughs> that goes to show that sometimes these problems are a little deeper than you realize at first. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll give kind of an, up, you know, an intro of what Kafka is, because I, you know, I, this, is, this is the first mention of Kafka. But we, so we made this system Kafka, and it was meant to serve that role. And you know, what it was was really you know, kind of similar to these messaging systems. Um, you know, you would have a, a cluster of servers. You would have servers that were acting in a role as producers, and they would send, you know, streams of events. And you would have uh, servers that are acting as consumers, and they would consume events. And of course, a server could be both a producer and a consumer. There's no law against that. It's just like, you know, a role. 
Um, and so at a high level, we're kind of like basically just making yet another messaging system. And um, you know, actually, you know, at first when we talked to people in the company, or um, later when we open sourced it outside, people are like, you know, why would you make another messaging system? And we we're like, well, it's really different on the inside. <laughs> um, and it turns out it's really different on the outside too. But um, but it's kind of a subtle point, which is like the core abstraction the system is providing is totally different. It is like not a queue. It is not a messaging thingy. Uh, it's actually providing a log. And so. I've used the word log three or four times to mean three or four different things, and this is going to be one more thing, um, which is an ordered sequence of re records. And so we got this idea out of databases. If you've worked with databases, you probably know that there's like some commit log thing in the back doing something, God knows what. And in a distributed database, that commit log is very often the thing which distributes data to all the other replicas. And we thought, well, you know, if you kind of squint, you can kind of view that big picture with all the different systems as like a big distributed database. And you could imagine having some kind of like core commit log that everything would like, you know, commit their data to. And, and maybe this abstraction would be good. And um, so this is my picture of a log. These are meant to be records, rectangles or records. Each thing you write into the log gets a number. So you're, it's like 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, uh, and so on. And, you know, that's kind of like the key for the thing, um, but instead of like accessing it random like you would with a key value store, you know, really readers kind of are at some point in this log and they kind of read to the right. So, um, you know, right is the future, left is the past, each thing which is reading is at some point in time. This reader is at seven, this reader is at nine. Um, and, and this is kind of the core abstraction that Kafka provides. And um, it turns out that this is actually a pretty good way of implementing published subscribe messaging. So if you, you change reader to consumer and writer to producer, then like, you know, voila, and you make this available over a network, then it's like a the messaging system. Um, and it turns out that you can do a lot more with this. Um, this abstraction, like, it, there's a reason it shows up in distributed computing internals over and over and over and over again, um, which is not something I'll really get into the in this talk, but, um, I'll talk a little bit about one of the applications, which is stream processing, because that's you know that's relevant. Um, so okay, in in Kafka, um, a topic, which is like a category of data or you know a feed or whatever. So a topic for LinkedIn might be page views or like ad clicks or like searches or whatever, like you know user account updates. Um, a topic is basically a partitioned set of logs. So I showed that log concept. Now there's just more of them. I put three here because that was as much as I could draw on a slide. But um, you could imagine, you know, maybe a hundred or, or however much. And um, this this is basically what what Kafka gives you. It allows you to spread these, you know, partitions over a cluster of servers. Each partition is persisted. Um, and it, it actually allows you to get pretty good performance, even though it's persistent data. And um, it replicates each partition over multiple servers, so that you know, if one of these guys dies, you don't lose your, your data. And so in that respect, um, Kafka looks a lot like, kind of like a file system, if you imagine this being like a file, um, kind of like a file system. But what's different is we're expecting writes to just like continue forever. It's multi-writer, so you can have lots of things writing, just like a local file system. And um, it's built to really make it efficient to kind of tail the file and have lots of readers hanging off of it. So, so that's, that's kind of like the core abstraction. The second abstraction, which is useful uh, and doesn't always come across in a talk, is the ability to consume these logs in, in clusters or groups. So obviously, if you can scale your data, like all the page views coming into a big consumer scale website, and you want to be able to process that, you have to have a way of splitting up that data over like readers so that they can each do a fair share of work. And so Kafka has this notion of groups, which is a way that a bunch of processes, now the boxes are processes, can identify themselves as being part of like group A and you know, consume or group B. And that way you can kind of scale that out. And that's how you can have like a Hadoop cluster, which has lots of nodes, be able to kind of you know, consume and um, coordinate and make sure each message gets into Hadoop, but also have all those messages fork off to something else, like your search cluster, right? And so one of the key points about this, if it didn't come across from the picture, is that um, each of these topics or logs is basically multi-subscriber. So you can start with no subscribers and just write the data in case somebody someday uses it, and then later things can kind of come in and tap into that stream and use it 
kind of at will, like whenever they want to. Um, and things can go away, and that's fine. So like the consumers are really like a very lightweight abstraction in Kafka because all they really are is just like a pointer into this persistent log. So like um, unlike the enterprise messaging systems we were looking at where they keep like a queue for each reader and therefore you're kind of like storing the data one time for each reader if it's being persisted. Uh, in our case, a consumer is really just this number like seven, right? Like you have to remember that the consumer is there. But that's really all the state that you have. So these subscriptions are pretty cheap. And consuming is really just like reading this data out of a file, which is like pretty cheap on computers. So, so that's that's like you know what it does. That's kind of like all there is to say about Kafka. And so we could like end the talk there. Um, but there's a little bit more. I'll walk through kind of the characteristics of it as a distributed system. Um, the first thing we needed was we needed to be able to handle like log data, like big, not that valuable data. Um, and to do that, you have to have good performance, like good unit performance. Each server you buy adds, you know, capacity, and that capacity is like cheap, right? So you want to be able to get kind of like what you get when you log out to the file system, like hundreds of megabytes per second per server of throughput. You want to be able to store many terabytes per server. You want to be able to run this on, you know, cheap hardware. Um, and then most importantly, um, and this is actually another big difference with databases or message queues, you know, you don't want it to get slower as you write more data. And so, like, one of the key problems with a lot of these messaging systems was, you know, as the queue gets full, the writes get slower, which is kind of like a meltdown scenario. It's like you're circling, <laughs> you're circling the drain. The more, the more you write, the slower it gets. You obviously can't have that characteristic. It has to be, you know, equally cheap to append your fourth, you know, writes when you have four or five terabytes as it was when you had nothing. Um, and okay, so, so that's literally handling large volume data. Being able to handle important data really means you know, getting persistence and replication right and being able to get ordering right. I talked a little bit about why you need ordering and why you need to model all the way to your consumers that handles that. And, and finally, and this is probably the most important thing, was we really felt there was a big difference between a system which was designed from the ground up to be replicated and distributed, and a system that was basically a single server system where you try and glue on some replication layer. And so, like in our first attempt, we were really trying to glue something on. You know, like people often do this with like sharded MySQL. You have MySQL and you try and glue some layer on top. And we really felt like you can do a better job if you design from the ground up for something that's meant to be run, replicated, distributed, and operated that way. And just the way you interact with that type of system is very different, right? You expect to be able to take machines down for maintenance whenever you want. You expect that that won't, you know, impact the producers or consumers using the overall cluster. You expect that you know a server can fail and lose all the data on its disks, and you don't actually lose data from the system. It, it handles that. Um, all these kind of things that you would um, expect from a modern distributed system. We wanted to make sure we had that. Um, and so this became kind of that that stream data platform component where we were you know multiplexing data to different things, and we spent a big chunk of time basically just rolling this out for different use cases, like getting logs into it getting database changes into it, getting the reverse path. Because it turns out that like, yeah, you want to get data into Hadoop, but probably your goal was to also like do something with it and then get the data back out and get it out to like search clusters and relational databases and key value stores and all that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, we spent a bunch of time on basically, you know, rolling out these new use cases and kind of converting all the data that there was. And um, one of the areas we had originally hypothesis would be useful um, but we didn't really like know for sure was the stream processing area. So we, you know, we thought, well, you know, maybe, maybe if we had some like central copy of everything that was happening in real time, we would like do something with it. And it, it turns out we did. Um, so you know, I, I'm going to dive into the stream processing area. I'll give a little bit of information about how it's related to Kafka and what these things have to do with each other. Um, and you know, mostly what I want to convince people of is this is actually a pretty exciting, powerful area. And, and so hopefully, you know, I'll, I'll give a little bit of information and hopefully it'll convey that. Um, so what I mean by stream processing, you know, if you imagine some query, I think I came up with this as a query, you know, SQL. This is a query that's looking for, you know, the spend on a per advertiser basis, maybe by day or something. And you could imagine running this query in two different ways. Like the way people know queries is like 
you put all your data in a big pile, maybe in your data warehouse or in the database, and you like run the query over all the data and you like get back some results. And that's kind of like the classic way we uh, write data systems. So the data system maintains the pile of data, the query runs over the data, and it gives you back some results. Um, but there is an alternative, and it's kind of present actually in databases in sort of like a like larval form or like whatever, which is um, like triggers or materialized views in databases, which actually work the opposite way, right? Some update comes into the database and it like reacts to that update. And so you could actually imagine running this query in a totally different way. You could imagine like having the query running like all the time and like streaming data through it. Um, and it's like, well, why? Why would you ever want to do that? <laughs> um, but that is basically what stream processing is. Stream processing is basically you know, having the change flow through the query. And I'm going to argue that it actually makes a fair amount of sense. If you think about it, most data in companies is not piles. It's actually a continuous process that generates data. So like page views was one of our topics. Page views, they just keep happening all the time. There's not like a fixed table of page views. It's like a thing which just keeps happening. And most of the processes which, you know, process data, they do it over and over. So maybe they do it on a 24-hour schedule, maybe they do it on an hourly schedule, maybe they do it all the time, but it's kind of weird, right? Like why, you know, if the data is continual and the processing is effectively continual, maybe it would make sense to just like invert the whole paradigm. And, you know, this is not a new idea. This was like present in academic literature for a while, but it's really kind of starting to come to the forefront. And I think it's come out of like this use of event data, um, the type of applications people have now, um, I, I think has really made this model start to make sense, and the infrastructure is just struggling to keep up, like struggling to catch up and make it practical, um, and, and that's what I'm going to talk about. So, so I kind of want to like introduce this stream processing area a little bit. So I, I kind of gave the query example. Another way to think about this is kind of like the core paradigms for programming are, are really these three. So you know, request response programs are something probably most people spend much of their time working on. You know, that's like a HTTP request. Somebody makes an HTTP request, you do some work, and you give back a response, right? And so if you think about that in, in this model, it's like you give one input, which is the request, you give one output, which is the response. Um, that is how request response processing works. Um, the flip side to that is basically batch processing. And most people's first program was a batch process. You probably wrote some like Unix command line tool if you if you were subjected to a computer science education. You probably had to write something and it like reads in a file and it like does something and it spits something out. You know, you wrote like cat or something, something really good like that. Um, and the way these work is they kind of like read all the inputs and they kind of produce all the outputs kind of all at once, right? Not quite all at once, but kind of seems like all at once, right? And that's a batch program, and then you would schedule it to run, you know, I don't know, when somebody says run, or maybe, you know, in practice, you know, if you're thinking about like a data warehouse cycle, maybe it's like at midnight. I don't know why midnight, but midnight is just like a good time. Good time to be woken up when it doesn't run, right? And um, so in that model, you were giving all the input and you were getting kind of all the output. And you know, it doesn't take like a, a genius to be like, well, you know, hey, <laughs> we could give like some input and we could get like some output back. Um, and that generalization of like, well, hey, maybe instead of getting like all the inputs, we could get like a little bit and we could give some back. That's basically stream processing. And so this is actually really flexible, right? If you imagine taking every input and giving back one output, right, then you have request response. If you imagine like reading it all and not doing anything and giving back, you know, a bunch of outputs all at once, then you have batch. And so this stream processing, like in my view, I think it actually kind of like generalizes those two extremes, right? Um, the program is now in control. This is a pro the box is a program. Box used to be a record or you know a process. I don't know, but now it's a program, um, and it gets to control you know how many inputs it's going to read before it gives you back some output. And um, it could be it could be request response like it could be batch like. Um, you know, it's totally up to the program. So it just it gives you a little bit of generalization, and that turns out to be really important for dealing with these kind of continuous data sources, especially if you're trying to get results that are kind of fresh uh, for computation that wants to be frequent or fresh. Um, it makes a lot of sense. And this is actually not how people usually think about stream processing. They usually don't think about it as being like a generalization of their other approaches. They think about it as being this sort of like, like transient, approximate, lossy thing where like, 
you know, there's something and it's throwing data at me and I, don't, I can't process it, I don't know anything, I'm just gonna like estimate everything and it'll all go get the wrong answer, but it'll be really quick. And if it comes in too fast, I'll drop it on the ground. That's kind of like, I would say mentally when I talk to people, that's like their model of this. And I would say, I don't think that's true. I mean, you could write a stream processing system which loses data and is, you know, approximate and lossy, but there's nothing about the model that requires that. It's actually, you know, quite powerful when, when done right. And I think we're just at the point where it's starting to get right. So the second observation, um, and, and this is kind of like so obvious that you feel dumb putting it on a slide, but it requires a little bit of thinking to realize is if you collect data in batch and you need to write programs that deal with like multiple inputs, you know, like data from different parts of the organization, then you are going to do batch processing. So like if you dump all your data out of databases at the end of the day into your data warehouse, and the data warehouse is the only place where you have all the data, then like processes can really only take off at midnight and like this whole streaming idea doesn't really make sense, right? Because like the data is dumped, so the processes are gonna be batch processes. There's like no other way, right? Um, and this is kind of obvious, but, but not obvious. So like you basically have to have streaming data to really do stream processing. Um, if you don't have any streaming data, you can't do it. And actually this happened to us um, at LinkedIn. When I first got there, this, this company came that was like out of, I think, Berkeley, and it was called Truviso, and they'd made a stream processing system, and they came to sell it to us. And we were like, okay, this is amazing. This sounds really cool. What should we do with it? And they were like, well, just like stream data into it. And we said, well, we have these like files at the end of the hour. What should we do with them? And they were like, well, you could like stream them in at the end. And we were like, yeah, but we could also just like put them in our data warehouse and query them like, how would this be better? And they were like, well, I don't know, right? And we were like, huh. <laughs> um, so it turns out to do stream processing, you have to have streams. There, there was a whole generation of, of stream processing companies that missed that um, important point. <laughs> Having gotten involved in a newer uh, stream processing uh, company, I'm, I'm very sympathetic. <laughs> um, so okay, the question is now, okay, so clearly you have to have streams of data if you're gonna do processing, but is that really useful? Like, will people do it? Are there good use cases? Is there a lot that you can do with this? This was sort of like not really known to us. Like we knew when we were doing Kafka, we had to like pipe data around between things. That was like real, it's like plumbing. Like when you flush the toilet, it has to go somewhere, right? When, <laughs> when you generate data, it has to go somewhere. Um, and we believed that like, hey, if we had a bunch of these data available as streams, and it was really easy to just kind of like tap into it without like big impact on the system. We believed like, hey, a bunch of stuff would make use of that. Um, it turned out that was true. So. So actually this log structure I talked about, it turns out that you know, in addition to being a good publish subscribe messaging system, it actually kind of helps to unify like stream processing with batch processing, you can use it for a lot. So a batch process is something that would like wake up and like read and process and then like maybe go to sleep and then like midnight it wakes up and it sees what more data it has and it like processes and it goes to sleep and then it wakes up. That's like how a batch process is, you could totally do that off this structure. Um, and a stream processor is something that would probably like keep more towards the end and process in real time. And so but by having this, you could actually get a pretty powerful stream processing system that wouldn't be totally transient and lossy, right? It wouldn't be like, oh, if data came into this log too fast, the stream processor would like fall down and lose everything. Like it would just come into the log. I mean, the stream processor, maybe it couldn't quite keep up for that minute, but it wouldn't like lose everything. So you wouldn't necessarily get the wrong answer. Um, and, and this idea of like thinking about data streams and stream processing, I think it's pretty general. I um, I have a bunch of examples that are like web company examples, but sometimes it's helpful to think about something that's like in a space people understand that's like more intuitive, like retail. Like you can really think about at a high level what's happening in a company as being kind of streams of data. Like you can think about sales that are occurring as a stream of sales. Um, you can think about shipments and inventory coming in as a stream, right? You can think about like adjustments happening and you can think about price, you know, computing off that and deciding like, hey, we have to raise prices because we're selling out or we have to lower prices. You can think about using that same thing for detecting fraud and doing analytics. And you can actually think about most of these processes as continuous processes that happen in a company. And you know, I, most of them are not built this way in most retail companies, but it is kind of like the most natural way to think about what the business is doing um, from a you know, um, computer science standpoint anyway, is being you know, processing streams of data, producing streams of output, and you know, kind of having these feedback loops. So you know, in Kafka, what, what is stream processing? It's actually you know, not complicated. You're basically uh, taking input Kafka topics, these logs, 
your, your, you have programs of some sort, like it could be anything. It could be you know, a Python program, it could be a Java program, it could be some fancy stream processing framework, um, which can like transform this stream of input and produce output, um, you know, transform it again and produce output. Probably eventually you're gonna wanna get this to some kind of like query system, like a database that you would serve back to users. But you know, this type of like materializing changes off of the stream is, is, is you know, not foreign. And most people are actually kind of familiar you know, to this style of processing. If you've used Unix tools, right, you kind of have programs and you can kind of pipe them together. Um, and you can kind of think about this Kafka topic as being a little bit like the pipe notion. It's a little different because it's actually like a named pipe if you're like a Unix nerd, but because um, you can pipe to multiple things. But you know, that kind of that kind of ruins the simplicity of the example because nobody knows what a named pipe is. But um, but uh, you, you know, and it's it's kind of a modern version, right? Like obviously Unix pipes were from the day when we all like you know, logged into a central server and, you know, ran programs in one location. And so now we have a big data center and we're going to want to, like, you know, make it distributed and, you know, distribute the pipe over many things and so on. But, but it has that same idea of decoupling your input source and your output source from the logic you're writing. Um, and this actually, you know, makes it possible to feed in data that's of the, the same structure. Um, from many different, you know, systems or inputs, which, which is kind of that example I was giving with job use. So, it, and, and that transformation, you know, can be helped by uh, stream processing frameworks, of which there's kind of like a burgeoning ecosystem. So there's, there's like a lot of activity happening here. I would, I would describe none of these as being done in the sense that they like fully solve the problem for people, but they're all kind of under active development. And, you know, if, if I were, this is our, this is our only mathematical equation of the night, which is like, in some sense, you know, Kafka is providing like a, a stream. These frameworks are providing kind of like processing, like they're an application development uh, framework for building, you know, stream processors. And if you kind of put these together, you get like stream stream processing. Uh, so that's kind of the relationship between um, these stream processing frameworks and Kafka. And you you often see them deployed together. Like most of these frameworks can take input from different sources, but in practice, I think most people end up using them with with Kafka or something very like it. And um, so anyhow, we, we rolled this out at, at pretty large scale. Um, you know, it's always impossible to draw these big architectural pictures. I showed the, the messy picture uh, that we started out with. Um, this is a little closer to what we ended up with. You know, the power was we could basically take you know, application data and logs of different types. We could take database changes. We could kind of get that into our central stream data platform. That became the source for this offline world and where it got data. Um, but but it also, you know, kind of became the source for this kind of burgeoning real-time ecosystem. So it turned out that a security team turns out to be a team which mostly looks at like what's happening in the company and looks for bad things. So they basically became a big Kafka consumer team, and that was really what they did was like look for the bad stuff in the Kafka feeds, um, log search, you know, real-time analytics and monitoring. There was a whole family of tools we had that kind of fed off of this ecosystem in different ways. Um, and then, you know, arguably most importantly was the ability to take in feeds of like original data, transform it in applications or in stream processors, and be able to get that like back out to, to serving systems in different ways. So kind of the, the LinkedIn um, news feed you see on the homepage does this. It's like basically a bunch of Kafka feeds of events that get kind of processed and prioritized and then you know, fed out, as, as did a number of these other systems. So that was kind of the, the simplification. And in particular, I think the pattern I see like outside of LinkedIn as well is is really this kind of emerging, you know, like real-time analytics stack where people are capturing these like event streams in Kafka. Um, they're doing maybe you know some kind of uh, transformation in a stream processing layer to kind of like join on other attributes or enrich the data in some way. They're putting it into some kind of like OLAP or time series database or something that serves it. You know, if it's monitoring stuff, maybe it's like a, you know Graphite or something and or Druid. I mean, there's there's like uh, many of these and there's like gazillions of these that you can't even name them all. Um, and then really being able to serve this type of real time, you know, graphs on top of it. Um, LinkedIn had a stack that was pretty, you know, pretty much like this and was like, you know, the, the um, this was kind of like jury rigged, but it, it ended up being this like amazingly powerful thing where the, where the whole company ran off this like monitoring and analytics stack and everybody from like the CEO down like spent all their time like looking at these metrics and like it was like really cool and like totally culture changing over the time that we got that in place. Um, and I, I kind of came to think like, you know, there, there's actually kind of an analogy to a traditional data warehouse, 
Like in a traditional data warehouse, you kind of, you know, do three things. Like you get all your data into one place. Like you, you kind of put it all in one place. You run like ETL or processing on it. And then it supports an ecosystem of like mostly daily reporting, but maybe applications around your, your data. Um, and you know, it's, it's very batchy, like maybe it loads once a day, but, um, but that's kind of the, the pyramid. And I think this kind of stream data platform concept is actually kind of sim similar. Like you're basically getting you know, all your data in one place. Again, this is kind of like these streams of data. You can actually have a platform that scales out to company scale and you can have all the streams there. Um, you're able to do that same kind of transformation. Now it's a continuous transformation. Um, and you're able to support the kind of like, you know, real-time analytics and, and real-time applications that would live on top of that. So it's actually kind of analogous. I think the use cases that this is suitable for are different from like a data warehouse. It doesn't like replace the data warehouse or anything, but like it's more operational. It tends on being more application focused. Like there's more stuff that's kind of closer, closer to what's happening right now um, because of the latency. Um, but, but I think it's actually a pretty powerful, you know, stack or concept or way to think about data. And you know, we we like I said, we we spent a bunch of time at like basically putting this in practice at LinkedIn. Um, you know, I think we got to the point where pretty much anything that happened in the company was represented in one of these streams. Um, there was uh, well over a trillion messages that were written to Kafka per day and actually um, much beyond that read because of course it's multi-subscriber and about a petabyte of you know, data stored in the Kafka clusters. And you know, this was something that pretty much every engineer and every process would interact with in different ways. So it became a pretty powerful platform. And we open sourced it and it, you know, it's used all over including you know, Yelp, uh, here, I, I'm told. <laughs> um, so, you know, that's been one of the most rewarding parts of the project is actually, you know, seeing this same idea like work out other places. Um, that's been really fantastic. And, um, you know, af after seeing this adaption in other places um, kind of over and over again and, and, and seeing people basically trying to, you know, rebuild the stack we felt like we had internally, um, I and a few of the other people at LinkedIn who are on the Kafka team left and we started a company which is doing that. Um, we have a we have a product which is you know Kafka plus like a lot of the stuff you need like REST access and clients and schemas and metadata management and like connectors to all these different systems. That's like something we're working on now, um, and and we're really trying to put together like you know the the stream processing components and monitoring for all of it. Um, and so that's our product. Um, you know the the majority of this is actually purely open source, and you can go download it. Um, so so I highly recommend people try that out if if you're interested in it. Um, and that's that's it for the for the talk for me. If you're interested in Kafka, there is a Kafka Summit coming up. Um, you got to have a conference, right, for everything. So um, if you're doing something interesting with Kafka, you're just enthusiastic about it. It'll be in San Francisco um, in the not too distant future. Um, and you know, if you're interested in this area overall, we do have a blog at Confluent which goes into much more depth on like stream processing and different stream processing systems and Kafka stuff. And, and so if you go to blog.confluent.io, you can, you can read like epic volumes of more stuff in this area. And uh, I'd be super happy to, to take questions. Question. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna go one at a time. All right, so the question is why is it named Kafka? Um, and the answer is um, a little complicated. So there's several sort of like contributing factors. Naming is very difficult. We originally had a Harry Potter theme that we stuck with, but we kind of ran out of good Harry Potter names. You know, like there's a lot of internal systems and you know, you just run out quickly. So we were kind of looking for some other kind of writer related thing. And then, you know, that like first picture with everything on it, we were like, it's like pretty Kafka-esque, if you know what I mean, like complicated and bureaucratic. So we're like, we will replace the complicated picture with like Kafka. <laughs> um, the Kafka picture will go, I don't know. Um, yeah, it basically doesn't make sense. <laughs> what was your other question? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so I, I didn't get a ton into like roadmap stuff or what we're doing. This is more like retrospective. Yeah, yeah, so the question is like, okay, how should I get my Hadoop data in, you know, how should I get my data from Kafka into Hadoop or other things? And um, the we had basically like a MapReduce job called uh, Camus, popularly, or Camus, if you're French. Um, 
and uh, or you know a fan of I don't know existential literature or something, um, and you know th that was pretty good. But the problem was it only integrated like Kafka and Hadoop, and there's like hundreds of other systems, and people wrote like ad hoc integration, but it was like hard to run them all. So what we're what we're doing actually like right now there is a Kafka release in progress. Like we just did an RC, probably some terrible thing will happen with that RC, and we'll do a few more, and then there will be a release uh, based on prior experience. Part of that release is actually a framework which runs these like connectors, and so um, you know it, they act kind of like Kafka consumers. You can have a pool of them. You write like a plugin, and it runs this plugin at scale, and it will basically stream data between something and Kafka, and it could be like out of a database by capturing the change log into Kafka, or it could be out of Kafka into Hadoop, or it could be like I guess either direction is possible. Um, yeah, yeah. So it's meant to be kind of like a really easy way to write connectors. Yeah, and we we had basically a bunch of experience with this area from Mu and this other internal system Goblin. Um, and so yeah, I, I guess this is our best our best idea of how to do that. So if you're interested, um, there is a design document that's up on it, and there'll be we'll be talking about it a lot. So there'll be a bunch of information about it coming up. Um, it's part of a badge of Kafka. We're basically looking for help writing all these connectors. We're going to be doing a bunch of them for databases and hard things, but there's so many things out there to connect. Um, if, you're, if you're working in this area or you're adopting Kafka, you should definitely check this out. And if you're interested in contributing connectors, we'd be like thrilled. Um, we're really trying to get like an effective ecosystem of them. Question. Uh, so we use Kafka to stream process our uh, ticker data from different exchanges, mm -hmm. coin exchanges. Um, and one of the issues we're running into is the big, lo the log log sizes. Mm -hmm. So do you have any suggestions on that? Like how do you, like we have 48 hour log retention. Mm -hmm. And uh, even though we said logs should not be more than 100 gigabytes, it's going above that. So how do you manage that uh, when it comes to size of the logs? Yeah, so I think your question is like, you're running out of disk space in the Kafka cluster, what you do. Yep. I mean, you have basically two choices. You can keep the data for less time, or you can yeah, add that's, machines, that's what we're doing, right? or you can add machines, uh, and then have more space. Okay. Um, I figured you had it. I, I wish I had a better. You can actually turn on compression. That's my other. You only do okay. that once. So once you've turned it on, once things get smaller, but then the next time you run out of space, you have to think of a better answer because it's not like. <laughs> Fair enough. Hi, I'm Simon. I wanted to ask you about ordering. So you mentioned a couple of times that Kafka retains ordering, and I can imagine that uh, if you publish messages from like a single source, a single database, then you don't want the game to, them to get like messed up. But you mentioned you have multiple applications and multiple databases publishing to Kafka in the same time. And I was thinking, did you do some work on ordering those messages like across different data sources? Yeah, so, so maybe a way to generalize that question is like, what exactly does, I, I kind of talked about guarantees, but I didn't get real precise about what they are. Um, so the, you know, the way Kafka handles ordering is if you have two processes writing, it's actually very hard to reason about which writes should happen first, because in some sense they're happening at two points in time. There's not like some global clock that everything works off of. Um, and so what, you know, Kafka will retain those writes in some order, and that order will be stable across all the consumers but you don't know which if there's two writers. So, so really the guarantee we provide is, you know, if you, if you have a, um, from the point of view of one writer, you know, if I send something and it's acknowledged and I send another thing and it's acknowledged, then the first thing <laughs> will happen before the, sec the second thing. And that will be true for every consumer of that data. Mm -hmm. So but I'm asking a bit outside of Kafka of like yeah. how LinkedIn uh, approached the problem of trying to order data from multiple sources, because Kafka is in the middle of all this thing, and Kafka mm -hmm. has its own guarantees, but you probably want to process data, reading them of Kafka with like a single consumer, reading data from multiple data sources, mm -hmm. and you need to make some assumptions about order between those data sources. So it's good that Kafka doesn't mess this up, but how do you get your data yeah, sources? In yeah, yeah, so in general, um, what we did, yeah, there's many ways you can like model data. We uh, you know, typically advocated people doing it by table, Partitioning by primary key, the ordering would really be just by primary key, um, so it wouldn't be a global ordering. That tended to be good enough for what people needed, um, and it was easy to scale. So that, that was typically the way we dealt with ordering of, of data streams. Um, 
I guess you could do anything that those primitives provide that you wanted to, but that was typically our policy for data that had mutations. Thank you. Cool. I guess whoever just gets the microphone next, it's like, it's all in your hands. <laughs> Yeah, that's a great question. So maybe another way to ask that is like, what's the best way to capture you know, changes? One thing you could do is you could have an application which every time it does something, it like publishes some event, and then maybe it also updates its database. The other thing you could do is you could somehow try and like pull the database for changes or something. And which of these things should you do? Now, the challenge is you actually want to be quite sure that in all scenarios, even failure scenarios, the, the thing that the application said happened and the change in the database remain in sync, right? And so the two ways you could do that is you could feed the database off the, the log of changes to Kafka, or you can feed Kafka off the changes in the database. Um, but you want to do one of those two things if it's important that these remain in sync. Because you could imagine if you kind of write to one and then write to the other and you like crash in the middle, you're going to get one and not the other, right? So at, uh, at LinkedIn, and I, I think most people who have done this, um, you know, seriously for capturing lots of database changes. One way to do that is either to pull the table for changes, which is inefficient, or uh, tap into the database's commit log, which most databases provide some kind of change capture mechanism, and publish that. Um, the latter is a deeper integration, but is more efficient and usually more correct because like things like hard deleting a row always get capped. You know, nothing gets left out of the log. So, um, the what did LinkedIn do? The answer was basically like all of those <laughs> in different areas. But uh, the thing I would generally advocate doing is you know tapping into the log. One of the reasons we're doing this connector framework is actually to get good integration with different database log technologies. So in MySQL, you have like a bin log. You can subscribe to MySQL changes that way. Oracle has a couple of different ways of getting stuff. Postgres has something else entirely. Um, you know, I, I think the getting the right integration for each of those is some work. But one of the things we're trying to do is focus open source development on something that's like reusable so that everybody doesn't have to do this really deep integration work. But in general, yeah, the right answer of how to get data out of a database is usually the log of the database. Um, if you're willing to, you know, do the, do the work. If you're not, you can kind of pull the table. Um, we're shipping this framework already with something which pulls tables, which is easy if you don't have too many of these or the, the data isn't too large. Um, and we'll be doing the deeper log integration over time. Um, you can also, of course, have the application publish events and feed the database off that, but you won't have like read after write consistency between the two um, because that update would be delayed. Hopefully that answers your question. When you scale out to very large things, how do you make sure everything is coherent across many different paths and when you're pipelining some things can be slow and um, you know, so you start building up blocks and um, so you have to have an element of timing and stuff like that. Um, you, uh, could you go over how that happens because I could see where you might have a computationally intensive task and it just backs up the flow. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, okay, so I think there's a couple a of questions. I think there's that actually maybe hits on a couple of things I could say. So the first is, if you have a bunch of servers, how do you like keep them in sync? Like if you have some ordering, how do you ensure that all the messages are in the same order and that all the consumers get exactly the same thing? It's obviously easy if none of the servers fail. Um, but if your servers fail and come back and they come back maybe with stale data, uh, how do you handle that problem? That That's kind of like the classic log consistency problem was probably one of the older problems in computer science. And you know, we, we basically put a bunch of effort into making that like scale out to a cluster. The second, so so I mean, you know, that's that's like the problem that something like, you know, Paxos or Raft or these kind of like replication algorithms are trying to solve. So that's how we make Kafka, you know, do its guarantee correctly, is we basically, you know, do an algorithm like these that tries to maintain a consistent order over the replicas. The second question I think Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. Okay, so 
So, all right, so then there's, there's now we, we discovered three questions. So the second question I think you're, you're answering is great. Okay, so that's one cluster. How would this scale out over like a global deployment across data centers, which is absolutely one of the use cases? So the architecture we kind of support and you know, encourage is basically one where you have a local Kafka cluster in each data center. You interact with that, um, but the uh, replication between the Kafka clusters is kind of controlled centrally, rather than trying to spread clusters over all the data centers. And the, um, the advantage of that is you know, each of these data centers is basically an independent entity. Like the rest of the world could go down, you could lose all your connections to them, and you, you still have access to this local cluster, and you're not blocking on any network activity outside your you know, like local unit. And it also just, like from an operational standpoint, makes it easy to control data flow centrally and reroute things without having to get a bunch of people involved. Um, so that's, that's about routing. This third question I think you might be answering is like, in these stream processing cases, if you have downstream things that are processing messages, how do you make sure that like a slow processor doesn't back up writers? So if you've interacted with enterprise messaging systems, they have this awesome feature, which is like, if your consumer gets slow, the back pressure like flows upstream, and then your producer usually blocks. And people think, well, this is really good. It's kind of good in cases where your producer is allowed to stop writing and just like freeze. Um, but in a lot of cases, you actually can't, right? Like if you're capturing events that people are like people are clicking, you can't like tell them like stop. <laughs> like <laughs> we are experiencing back pressure because somebody's program that they're running in like a you know whatever test mode is slow. Like you can't do that, right? So um, Kafka actually does this differently. Like the commit you block on is the write to the replicated Kafka cluster. The Kafka cluster is expected to not run out of disk space, right? It's supposed to be like HDFS. You like scale it out and you have more space. So um, there is no back pressure from consumers. So like the reason you don't need back pressure is because like each server gives you five terabytes of space. Like you have so much buffer that it's no longer this like, you know, if you, if you just have a little bit of in-memory buffer, like two gigabytes of data and then like the whole world melts down, then you have to be like really harsh about back pressure, which often doesn't fix the problem at all. Um, if on the other hand, you can have like, you know, five or 10 or 20 terabytes per server and you can have a whole cluster of servers, you basically have infinite buffer, right? Like the rate at which you write data will actually give you enough time, like writing at maximum rate for one of those servers, it will still take several days to like fill up the disks. And so you, you actually no longer need, need that. And what you can operate on is like an SLA, where you say, you know, the default for us was seven days. I don't know why, just because like, seemed like a good number. So we would say like, look, after somebody writes data to the cluster, you have seven days to consume it if you're a consumer. If you don't consume it after seven days, it's gone. If you do, it's still there. You could consume it again if you want to. Uh, we retain and roll stuff over you know, every seven days. That makes your operation totally predictable across you know, all of this stuff. You kind of control that retention time frame. I, I think practically this is a much better way to operate this stuff. And in practice with a messaging system, you end up having to have that anyway because like, you can't just run out of uh, disk space and like, knock it over if you have a big shared system. So you're going to have to have some SLA about when consumers have to get their stuff. So that, that may answer your question there. So like the advantage of this is you can be totally oblivious to like bad actors downstream. So you can have a whole ecosystem of different teams that process data and one bad team doesn't like, you know, by being slow, they don't like impact the global data flow graph of like a thousand engineers and like bring everything to a halt. And that's just like a really important characteristic, but kind of subtle. Hi, this is uh, Chin. Um, I guess I'm, I'm thinking out loud is can, can we, I know it's not a replacement for data warehousing, but can it be used because it's a messaging solutioning, but it has a very solid persistence mechanism that ties to do. Mm -hmm. Can we use that, um, stretch it and use that as the system of record moving forward? Yeah, yeah. So uh, like one way people often ask this question is like, is it a bad idea to store data in this system? And the answer is no. I mean, we basically designed for that use case. In particular, we wanted to make it possible for stream processing systems to like go back and reprocess when you change your code or algorithm. Um, and it turns out for a lot of these like database replication cases, it's actually really useful to be able to like reload your search cluster or nodes of your search cluster off the upstream background. So like the reason we have all this like fancy persistent stuff, which is hard to do, um, is 
precisely to make that happen. Now, you know, does that replace data warehouses? No, right? Like, data warehousing technology is very, you know, it depends on the system you're talking about, but if you talk about like a system like Teradata, incredibly, you know, amazing like query optimization layers and like really efficient, like all this kind of stuff, like there's nothing like that in the streaming world at the moment. Um, so can you store data? Yes. Can you replace like everything data warehouses do? No. Could you theoretically replace some things data warehouses do over time as it got, you know, the technology start to get better? Yeah, probably. Right. And then the other caveat to that, you know, in terms of using this as a persistence layer over a long period of time, is any of these things which store data for a long time, you have to be real good at running. So, you know, whatever your kind of source of truth thing is, you gotta really nail operations on that and like know that you know it and know how you monitor it and all that kind of stuff. So, but you know, with that caveat, yeah, it's, it's it was totally designed to store data and it's not an unreasonable thing to do. Uh, thanks for the talk, Jay. Appreciated it. Uh, my name is Sadant, and I have a question regarding internally to Kafka, internally to the program, what is the bottleneck in stream processing? And how does that compare to other systems that are out there? Um, and then part two is how does that compare to systems like Colossus, which you might have heard of Google's mm -hmm. stream processing mm -hmm. um, system? Yeah, OK, that's a great question. So. Um, you know, the, the question is like, what's the bottleneck for stream processing? Really, it depends on the job. In practice, what we saw was most stream processing jobs want to do either aggregations or joins, and that ends up being the expensive thing. So aggregation meaning you're counting or summing or whatever, and that's usually a big counter sum over a bunch of entities, like all your users or, you know, page views for all your users or something. Um, and or they're joining on side data. And so for most stream processing things, you're going to do one of those two things. And when you do that, will almost certainly be more expensive than the physical act of like streaming data through the program, which is usually kind of comparatively cheap. Um, it, so, you know, we kind of optimize around that. There's a whole, you know, like we're, we're kind of just starting to do a bunch of work in the stream processing area. One of the things we've really tried to support is like maintaining these you know, stores of aggregates that are in flight or data that you're going to join on and doing that really efficiently, primarily because that is like far and away the slowest car in the race or whatever. And everybody like kind of stacks up behind that. So if you have one stage that's doing a side join and if, if that side join, you could imagine like a naive implementation that like calls out to a remote database and looks up. You know, if you do that, it really doesn't matter that you were getting like a million events per second upstream because like when you do that, then you're down to like, a thousand events per second per you know per process, right? Um, and so you're like many orders of magnitude slower. So from my perspective, like usually the big problem is going to be that kind of I/O intensive side lookup or aggregation. Um, if that's not the case, then you know can be many things. Usually a next good candidate is like serialization because people do funky things around serialization and just like deserializing data gets really expensive. You know if that's not it, it's often uh, Kafka writes are probably next up. Kafka reads are usually pretty cheap, so so that, that's kind of like the stack rank. If you compare that to other systems, it depends on the system. Um, I would say most stream processing systems out there don't do good support for joins or <laughs> aggregation. So like, it's usually like a non a non. You're usually querying something like a key value store or something. It's usually much slow. Um, if you compare it to what Google is doing, I don't know because I I don't know the performance. Um, they, they definitely have like a storage engine, Colossus, which is like pretty amazing. I'm, I'm sure it's like well optimized. Um, they have a they have a stream processing layer, Dataflow, which I think is like state of the art and really good. It's only available in their cloud hosting environment for people, but it's really good. Um, so if you're there, that's like a pretty good thing to use. Um, I, I think open source is kind of catching up to some of the ideas in that in some ways. Couple more questions. Yeah, anything we don't get to now, I'm I'm happy to take offline. Um, hey, okay. thanks for the talk. Uh, my question is, how do you deal with uh, uh, partitioning and then consuming data in highly unpredictable environments? Say mm -hmm. when you have like a surge of events that you need to process and you want to maintain low latency and uh, still process them in the order of coming in. Yeah. Okay. So by um, Partitioning, you could mean network partitions, or you could mean sharding up of data. Sharding, okay. Um, so yeah, how is data sharded? Basically, 
I kind of showed how you can have those like logs, and each log is basically a shard. Those shards are distributed over nodes in the cluster. Um, the way it's done is, you know, each uh, you know shard log partition has a leader that is responsible for writes. It has followers which are elsewhere in the cluster. Each physical machine is both a leader for some of its partitions and a follower for other partitions. When a machine fails, you reelect uh, new leaders for all the things it used to be the leader for. Um, that's basically how it works. Then you can basically migrate these partitions however you want. So you can say, oh, move this partition over here. And what it will actually do is it will actually make that other server a follower. So maybe you had replication factor three, now you have four, and it catches up. And when it catches up, it basically kills off the old one. And now you're back down to three again, and that's how like movement. So you can kind of dynamically place these things, however. And then you had another question, which is how to manage consumption in a dynamic environment. So I didn't get into consumers a ton. I guess the important thing about the Kafka's model for consumption is, you know, we take that set of partitions which are ordered, and we basically divide them up over consuming processes. So each process owns a subset of the partitions. So it can kind of consume them at its own pace. If you have two things consuming the same log, uh, like two processes, which are like, or two threads, which are consuming independently, it's very hard to guarantee ordering. Like they would have to coordinate on each thing they read, which would be very slow. So one of the things that motivated this was, that's how messaging systems usually work, by the way. But we thought once you have a partitioning model in the system itself, you can actually use that to partition up consumption as well, which is what we do. Um, and that allows you to be much cheaper because you only have to do that kind of coordination or agreement um, amongst the consuming processes when somebody dies, which hopefully isn't all the time. Hopefully it's a rare occurrence. So I, I don't know, that may give some idea. It's probably a deeper question of everything having to do with that. All right. Uh, I'm curious if you have an opinion about Kafka versus some competing platforms like Kinesis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay, so, so yeah, Kinesis is like a AWS service. It's very similar. Um, they host it. Uh, it's a little bit more limited in terms of feature set, but they run it. So that's the trade-off. Um, the integration and ecosystem is probably not quite as good. It doesn't do like some of the fancy stuff like log compaction for database, database data. Um, but they host it. <laughs> um, so maybe until we get a hosted Kafka, then uh, that's a good that's a good answer. I think if you if you don't want to get your hands dirty with stuff. Okay, should we thank our speaker and extra questions for afterwards? Um. Yeah, happy to take any questions offline. Thanks, everyone.